welcome to the next episode of Endoscopy Essentials. My guest today is Barbara Bastiansen from Amsterdam. A warm welcome. Barbara is with us for, for EndoClub. And Barbara, you were here last time and the team loved you so much that we had to get you back. So welcome again. Thank you so much. And you have a very special topic, but before we dive into that, we would learn, like to learn a little bit about you as a person. And, and my first question is always, how did you get into medicine? Because there are so many different ways, whether you come from a, a medical family background or who, who inspired you. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't come from a medical family background. I uh, grew up in this very small town in the Netherlands, in the south of the Netherlands, on a strawberry farm, actually. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but uh, medicine always got my attention, of course, because uh, I think it's the perfect... Uh, yeah, interface between science and, and humans, what I, what I love. And um, so it always had my attention, but to be honest, I didn't have a clear focus to medicine since, uh, since high school, but I, I wanted to, uh, first of all, I wanted to travel when I was finished. In my, mm -hmm. So I, when I was 18, I, I decided to go for a year to, to India with a friend and travel through India and Nepal. And then I had to, I couldn't, carry on with traveling, of course. So I had, and then I registered for medicine because uh, the other option would have been theater school, but I was, uh, I, th I think oh. I wasn't, I think I wasn't brave enough. I, I think I was scared to fail as an actress. So- um, uh, That's a very tough business, I think, right? <laughs> exactly. And uh, yeah, so that's when I started to uh, medicine in 1996. So you said got your attention already uh, at school by by what you were you were reading books or or how how, how comes? No, it was uh, it, for me it was very difficult to 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 think about okay what do I want to become you know and and being a doctor is of course uh, was something uh, uh, was something very concrete what I said it's, and. Um, uh, I wasn't completely not interested in corporate business or mm -hmm. uh, it, it's also if you study law or, or uh, philosophy, which is all very interesting, but I think what do you want to become and, and medicine, uh, yeah. So it starts with a gut feeling, right? Yeah. This could be something. Exactly. And then you go into medical school. Yes. But then it's, it's at least in many countries, it's like a continuation of school. At the beginning, right? You have anatomy and physics and that uh, kind of stuff. Yes, that's did, right. Did and, you like that? Uh, yeah, I like. I, I liked it. I, I definitely liked it. But it started to live uh, in the internships, of course. And then I think it's just the development comes where you get involved with, right? And then the heart grows and the interest <laughs> grows. And then I had my latest internship <laughs> within uh, the gastroenterology department. And that really caught my attention, but I still thought, no, I want to become an internist. So and we, that was in Amsterdam, or where was, where was in that? Amsterdam? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, I decided to become an internist, and I got into um, as a residency uh, in Amsterdam. So how how did you like internal medicine? It's uh, it's like you know. I was uh, yeah, I was getting a little bit worried after one year, like. Okay, so so I'm going to do outpatient clinic, and it's a lot of diabetes. It's a lot mm -hmm. of hypertension. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of uh, you know, and I, I, I didn't really catch me. Uh, and um, I always remember the very vibrant, more vibrant, more active gastroenterology mm -hmm. department. That's what I wanted to belong to, you know, to that group of people. They were very inspiring gastroenterologists, like. Uh, of course, you know the department in, in Amsterdam, and uh, that's why I wanted to become part of the family. So, and then uh, after one year, I decided to switch or try to switch residency, and at that time was, uh, yeah, was, I was able. So, uh, so I started, and I, I never, I never left Amsterdam since then. Yeah. It's it's interesting what you say because it's a basic decision what type of medicine you want. You know, internal medicine is often in, in, in the private practice. You you take care of patients for a long time. Yeah. You take care of a lot of diseases. But I, I can fully understand because you don't go in depth, right? Um, and it depends. So yeah. obviously you wanted to go in, more in depth and maybe doing something more manual. Yes, that was the practical part. I, of course, I like, but I also like oncology. Uh, uh, in the um, when I started 
in the internal medicine, I also had uh, an oncology, uh, half year of oncology outpatient clinic, and I really liked that part. And um, yeah. Well, that, I think that tells us a little bit why you ended up in this, you know, early cancer business. Yeah. Because when, when I think back, when I was young, oncology was far away. So we were diagnosing, we were treating a little bit, but nothing malignant other than for palliative intention. Yeah. And this, this has changed quite a bit. Amazingly. Yeah. yeah, amazingly over the last, what is it, 10 years or maybe even longer. Yeah. So when, when you enter the department, uh, you know, we know and we envy you guys in the Netherlands that uh, many people often start this kind of fellowship yeah. or PhD period where they start with research. Yes. Was that the, I, I didn't. the same for you? I didn't. No, you didn't. no, at that time. You started practically. Yes, I started with mm -hmm. the residency, mm -hmm. which was at now, nowadays, is very abnormal. You would do your PhD mm -hmm. and then start your residency. But at that time, it wasn't uh, always uh, in that sequential. Mm -hmm. And I, I was a very, no, I, 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 it never happened to me, uh, let's say, in that, in that way. So I, I started the residency and just continued from, from, from there. And uh, so I'm not a PA, I don't have a PhD. Oh, I see, no, nobody in Germany has. I'm, I'm just, you know, the system is very special. Yeah. And that's maybe one of the reasons why you guys do so brilliant uh, clinical research work. Because you are entering this field very early in the yeah. career. Yeah. And, uh, and usually I think it's a, it's a good mixture, isn't it? That some people do research, others do, do clinical work. Yeah, sometimes I might, I, I regret maybe a little bit that I didn't have my PhD mm -hmm. on forehand because it, it helps you to, I think it does educate you in another way. And of course I found out during, uh, during my, you know, my training and my practice and, uh, which also is good because, uh, uh, my interest in, in, in doing research came from the clinical part yes, of you. Yeah, huh? yeah. So it's because I, was in, I never intended to do research because I thought I was a good you know, clinician and that's the patients is where my heart is. But um, on, uh, yeah, uh, by practicing and being busy with where I'm busy with now, I, I, the, the interest uh, and, and also I want uh, yeah, the interest, and you want to do research because it comes naturally. Yeah, you want to find you want, out whether yeah, you're doing what, any what, good, right? Exactly. Well, unfortunately, I would say it's the normal way in most European countries, at least in Germany, yeah. that you go somewhere, you don't have a clue. So if I think back to my own career, I got the endoscopy journal, for example, when I was very young as assistant editor, and it was a very painful learning by doing, you know, reading reviews and that. Yeah. It's very thorough at the end, but sometimes I also would have wished to have more formal training at the beginning, so I can very much understand <laughs> what you mean. But I think the mixture is, is the good thing. And, yeah. and it's all about the, the what you allude to, the curiosity. I'm doing something in yeah. a patient, I do an intervention, so what what's the outcome, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and you got into the colon group at the uh, Amsterdam Medical University, right? Yes, yes. Early and also, uh, yes, and well, I, not specifically the colon group to start with, but, uh, um, you know, endoscopy came to me some kind of natural. So I really liked endoscopy. And uh, so I was very broad in the beginning when I had, uh, um, I did a lot of endoscopy and therapeutic endoscopy, not only colon work, but... Um, also ERCP and EUS and POEM, for example, mm -hmm. very quite early in, in, in uh, uh, yeah, as a staff member. But then, uh, of course, the colon work is uh, accumulating, as you know, so I had to, I had to focus more. And uh, so since two years, I mainly do colonic work. Well, yes. even with an endoscopy, I think people think endoscopy is a narrow field per se, but I think when we are honest, yeah. there's people are sub-specializing. If oh, you want definitely. to go in depth and do a very good work, I think it's necessary, it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, this, yeah, totally agree. And you're doing this work with the with the deep uh, resection in the rectum together with Leon Moons. Definitely. 
how how did it come? So who who was the first one? Was it, was you inspired by surgery or by complications uh, of surgery? Or? No, that was back in in I was already uh, since uh, we were quite early adapters on endoscopic full thickness resection, mm -hmm. and that's already ten years now, almost ten years in the Netherlands. And uh, so I was busy with endoscopic full thickness resection, and we quite early saw that T1 cancers is a good is a, is a perfect target. Um, but for the rectum, of course, uh, endoscopic full thickness is maybe uh, a little bit, uh, well, it's possible, but not maybe not the best technique. It's not that small, easy, right? No, it's also we'll, not We'll, we'll get to that in detail yeah, in yeah, further yeah. podcasts. But then okay. I, was, um, I was not doing ESD only since 2017. So I, uh, Paul Falkens, who was uh, the chair of our department, mm -hmm. sent me on a, a beautiful uh, advanced ESD course uh, in, in 2018. You could only enter when you already had some ESD experience, and I this, had some. This was where? This was in Salzburg. Ah, in Salzburg. Yeah. yeah okay. Mm -hmm. Frieder Bär was mm -hmm. organizing mm -hmm. it together for 10 years. He was doing it together with uh, all the Japanese experts mm -hmm. to train European endoscopists mm -hmm. in ESD. Unfortunately, it stopped now because, yeah, of course, they feel like there's enough Europeans who can mm -hmm. train Europeans by now. But, uh, and then there was uh, this uh, Toyonaga, I think it was Toyonaga who was there, and he, sh he in one of the uh, presentations, he showed a, a very short video of a what he called a PAM procedure, perianal endoscopic myotomy procedure, for uh, a lesion with a very severe fib fibrosis after previous resection. And then I thought, uh, wow, this mm -hmm. is... <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting, and um, and Leon and I were already um, uh, in contact with each other, and uh, we sent this video over, and then yeah, I think we both thought let's let's do it, let's start. So it yeah. was Salzburg, the home of Mozart, yeah, and the yeah, birthplace yeah, yeah. of the art. <laughs> it's true. It's ah, true. interesting. Yeah. Okay, and then you came back and started um, accumulating patients. The, the, another issue I'm often asked, and uh, may be helpful if, if you give us your advice uh, with regards to younger colleagues. Um, the, the Dutch system is very centralized, so it's not that everybody does ESD and EID. Is that a prerequisite for a more specific endoscopic training? Because otherwise you do not have enough caseload. Uh, no, it, it, it doesn't, it's not that organized as it maybe looks. It's not like uh, you cannot do ESD or, or if uh, everybody, it's not like there is a, a clear, how do you say, rule. clear rules, no. curriculum like in the UK. No, it's not. No, okay. it's not. Mm -hmm. no, it's not. But um, uh, it is true that, um, well, Holland is uh, uh, a small country and we work together naturally uh, and um, it's not like somebody in smaller hospitals would just start ESD for example by themselves uh, so uh, for for EID we have a EID uh, working group and now we have uh, six hospitals uh, which are trained in e EID and uh, we uh, we have regular meetings and we standardize the procedure and the reporting of the procedure and also standardize the way pathology needs to be assessed. And uh, yeah, we collaborate and we collect all, uh, all our cases together. And um, yeah. So you will learn pretty soon if something goes wrong and yeah, and yeah. If the technique has to be adapted. Uh, yes. Etc. Yes. Mm. Um, quite early, we already, yeah, it's not quite early. We found a way that we think the technique needs to be done. I mean, very important that we have the full muscle layer underneath the cancerous part. Huh? Mm -hmm. So in the in the very beginning, we, we, we started with the intermuscular di dissection only when the submucosal plane became a little bit foggy, you know? And then we, we found out usually you're too late. So and it's much easier. So you become if, braver and... Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Also because you, we, we know it's safe, huh? if you yes. stick yeah, to yeah. the intermediate, it's completely safe. But you have to learn. It's yes. like the initial period with poem. Yes. So I remember yeah. when the first, I don't know, 20 or 50 patients we were doing, uh, I was sweating like hell. And yeah. then when, when we were called by the ward, the patient has pain, we were running there together with the surgeon. And the yeah. surgeon looked into the room, saw the patient say, oh, it's okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. speaking of surgery, by the way, I mean, it, was it considered as something breaking into a surgical domain? 
how, how did the surgeons react? Did the yeah. endoscopists come up with this technique? I Which think, may be more precise at the end because you see the margins very nicely. Yes, we're very true. close. Yeah. Huh? We have very yeah. fine uh, accessoires mm -hmm. and uh, we have the ability to read reflex that surgeons don't have. But I think we are very lucky with our surgeons who allow us and also that they're like pioneers in the minimal invasive surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Uh, for example, Professor Willem Beumann, uh, he started, of course, with the laparoscopy and, uh, and uh, they are encouraging us. It, they really, in our MDT, if it can be done and scopic, mm -hmm. then, then they will support that because, yeah, they want the best for the patient as well, yeah. Well, I think it's also very important that you are working in a team where boundaries and possession yeah, exactly. of some procedures is not. not so important. No, exactly. Because long term, if it's a good procedure, it will be prevailed. And if you fight against it, you will eventually lose. So it's, I think, the wiser strategy as a surgeon to accommodate the, the yeah. new techniques. Yeah, and we, we, we learn from each other also. Yeah. I mean, the surgeons are also adapting our technique. For example, they, you need lifting to get to find the right mm -hmm. planes, mm -hmm. right? So they're, the Thomas surgeons are getting our needles mm -hmm. and um, okay. also trying to find the intermuscular plane and they, they, they see the benefits and so we work, yeah, I think it, we work okay. very close together. Yeah. I think everybody is very curious about the details of the technique and I'm sorry this will be further podcasts, not today, but at the end of this, Barbara, what does the word work-life balance tell you? Is that, uh, that's, that's a term which is... Uh, very popular now. Do you have yes. a good work-life balance? Uh, average? <laughs> no, but when you really like something, when yes. you really like something, it's sometimes it's, you know, you just, it's, yeah, you have to. It's work-work balance. You have to say, okay, this is it, and now I'm yeah. going to do something else. But uh, yeah, it's work-work balance. Work. <laughs> not, not like that, but yeah. I, yeah, I like my, I like my work. Yeah, that's right. But my, my balance is all right. Yeah. So what do you do? You you sometimes then say, okay, I'm off for two weeks and forget everything, or do you on holidays, holidays sit there and uh, it takes, new ideas coming? Um, and... um, well, it takes three days and then oh, okay. I'm, I'm you're off. I'm off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. You go far away for holidays. Oh, for holidays. Ah, oh, this summer I was in Iceland, ah. which was beautiful. But uh, yeah, I have uh, I have uh, two little uh, yeah two kids. They're not that little anymore. They're now ten and fifteen. But uh, um, they keep you busy anyway. They keep me busy. Yes. So they yes. are they're the best the best medicine to that's right they... distract you from the ID. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so thank you, Barbara, very much, and I'm very thank much you. looking forward to our further podcast on early rectal cancer.